When you're talking about the development of floating offshore wind off the south coast of Ireland, we have this incredible resource, but also we have national targets to meet and a moral responsibility to meet them in terms of decarbonisation of the economy. We also have a situation where the energy security picture in Ireland is extremely vulnerable and we need to develop our own indigenous sources of energy. That was Val Cummins, marine geographer and floating wind power advocate. And I'm Martin Nutty. I'm John Lee. Welcome to another conversation for the Global Irish Nation here on Irish Stew. Today's episode of Irish Stew is sponsored by Oum Art, where you can find original prints, jewelry, home decor, and custom gifts featuring Oum, the first written form of the Irish language. Visit oumart.com, and that's O-G-H-A-M-A-R-T.com, and listeners can save 20% at oumart.com using coupon code Irish Stew. That's O G H A M A R T. Hey, welcome everyone to another episode of Irish Stew. And today we head to the coast of Ireland and the many coasts of Ireland. Martin, where are we going? Hey, John, I thought there was only one coast in Ireland, you know, uh, but it is a very long one. I'll agree with you, you know, uh, apparently something in the range of three and a half thousand miles or five or six thousand kilometers, if you're kind of more metric inclined. Uh, that said, let, let me get to the point. I'm delighted that we have Val Cummins joining us today, especially in light of the fact that COP26 is winding up in Glasgow. Uh, for those uh, that have been paying attention, and it's been difficult to ignore in the news over the past two weeks or so, COP26 is basically a gathering of people uh, looking to address climate change and what needs to be done to mitigate uh, some of the problems that we're already feeling in our climate right now. Now, our guest, Val Cummins, works for a company called Simply Blue, and they're involved in an extraordinary project that will be based off the south coast of Ireland in Cork in an area called Kinsale. Specifically, the company is developing what is known as floating wind. So these are wind turbines that are tethered to the ocean bottom as opposed to pile-driven, which is a more kind of traditional offshore wind project and certainly different from the turbines that you see on land. And there's specific and unusual challenges in this particular approach, and we'll, we'll be talking more about that. But Val also wears another hat. She is an editor of Ireland's newest and rather impressive atlas, known as the Irish Coastal Atlas, which is a product of the University College of Cork Printing Press. And uh, that book apparently has been something like seven years in the making. So we're going to talk about both of these things. So I'd like to welcome Val to Irish Stew. Welcome, Val. Thanks, Martin. And thanks, John. It's absolutely lovely to be here and a fantastic opportunity to, to talk about the coastal zone in the context of the energy transition, the climate crisis, and equally in the context of what an amazing place it is with such richness and biodiversity. Um, and all of that is manifest through the, the coastal atlas. So I'm um, delighted. And I must say, I just love the way you say stew. Because <laughs> here it's an Irish stew. <laughs> but stew sounds much nicer. Yeah, we tried to avoid throwing in an extra H in there. It just doesn't sound kind of the right way. And I've been living in America long enough so that some of my idiosyncrasies of my Irish pronunciation have been excised or changed. I have a mid-Atlantic accent at this point in time. It's a great accent. Thank you. First of all, let's kind of talk a little bit about the Atlas. Um, there's a great video of you uh, posted uh, from August of this year when you get a delivery of a book and you're like you're just super excited about this and, and you're like saying it's seven years seven years yeah. what was that video about that was the day that uh, the first uh, print copy uh, arrived so I, I was in the office about to go home and there was a parcel on the desk and, and i was expecting um to receive the the full printed copy um from the the printers by way of cork university press and the box was there it was quite heavy. <laughs> and I thought this must be the Atlas. Uh, but there was an intern in the office at the time. I said, look, just take a little bit of a video of this or take a photograph of this for me because this is this is a big milestone. Um, and yeah, I was just so hugely excited 
to open that package and just to lift out what I think and you know there's huge consensus on it is just an absolutely beautiful publication of course I'm completely biased Mm -hmm. um but just to you know (laughs) for the first time to lift it up and to feel the weight of it it's just shy of five kilos um it's almost 900 pages it took seven years of hard work by a fantastic team and yeah that video that day just captured the joy of the milestone and just I suppose the delight of seeing the thing in print um and the quality um, at which it finally um, appeared at, you know, that was just amazing that day just to open it up. And we, we always said that we wanted it to be visually stunning. And um, absolutely, it came out just the way we had hoped. And then some, to be quite honest. Yeah, it looks like a fabulous book. And I, I would just add uh, a couple of things that I've kind of picked up from my browsing around the Internet. Uh, I noticed the Cork Examine on the other day referred to it as this is an astonishing work of erudition and will take its place in the works of scholarship that this country has produced. Or Graham Norton, uh, also interestingly, who is a Corkonian, for those who don't know how to refer to people from Cork, he is a Corkonian, although he's more famous for being on uh, BBC, on British television, had very high praise for the book, and I'll quote him as saying, the definitive examination of Ireland's unique relationship to the sea, a rare combination of the historical and the natural. The book is as comprehensive as it is beautiful and accessible. So uh, I think that's a pretty pretty impressive praise. So uh, you're, pretty, uh, you're, you're probably keeping your publicists uh, busy with that kind of endorsement. So congratulations on that. It's, it's been overwhelming. And, you know, it's just amazing just the last couple of months. There hasn't been a day or a morning goes by where you don't get some little bit of a buzz because of the Atlas, mm-hmm. whether it is something on WhatsApp or LinkedIn or you're just walking with the dog and somebody says, I just got it for so-and-so for Christmas and it looks beautiful. Right. Um but um, I suppose just to add to that, um, we've been nominated for the Irish Published uh, Book of the Year Awards through On Post um, and uh, look forward to going to uh, the gala dinner uh, with regards to that uh, award ceremony in a couple of weeks' time. And post-COVID, uh, it'll be the first time I think any of us have gone to a black tie event for quite a while. And to do it in this context, uh, it'll be great fun. And it's a, a privilege just to, to, get, to get that kind of nomination. But, you know, you, you mentioned Graham Norton's quote, um, there, um, Martin, and I suppose Ireland's relationship with the sea is fundamentally at the heart of this. And that's actually really fascinating. You know, we're a small island nation, um, but fundamentally we have been, um, you know, we're, we're internationally regarded as been green. You know, we're not internationally regarded as been blue. We have one of the largest maritime areas to land mass, ma- land mass in all of Northwest Europe. But, you know, traditionally we've turned our backs to the sea. We've looked inland and it's been about a agri-rural society uh, for the most part. The last number of years, you know, the sort of the economic focus has shifted to different sectors, IT and so on. Mm -hmm. Um, But the marine resource has been underdeveloped. Um, We have a very important uh, fishing sector. Our ports are vital lifelines uh, for the country in terms of of trade and, and prosperity. But, you know, you couldn't say that we have... A very considerable maritime economy. In fact, um, it's about 1.2% of, of our overall GDP. And you look at other European countries, uh, Denmark for me is, is fairly important as, as a reference point. It's 11% of GDP. And you ask why? It's because the Danes saw the opportunity with offshore wind and developed that sector very well over the last 20 years. And yet Ireland has a phenomenal offshore wind resource because of our position in the Atlantic. Um, But we focused more on onshore wind and again, turned our back to the sea. What's amazing about this point in time is that the Atlas has arrived when we're pivoting as a nation. And I think there's a much healthier understanding of our maritime resource and of the need to protect and develop that in a sustainable way. Um, And there are all kinds of really important decisions being made in the next couple of years with regards to designating areas as marine protected areas, for example, for conservation, but equally in relation to how do we ensure that we can have multiple use in a sustainable way. And, you know, in your introduction, you talked about floating offshore wind, and we can come to that later, but that's one of those new uses 
um, that we see there's huge potential for, um, not just in terms of what the sort of the sea um, area is going to look like, but the knock on effect that activity offshore will have at the coast and in and for coastal communities. And of course, the reason we were interested in the coast as um, sort of founders and editors of this Coastal Atlas project is because it's actually an amazing dimension. It's the only place on the planet where you have the atmospheric, the oceanic and the land mass forces all colliding. So from a mm-hmm. kind of geophysical perspective, it's fascinating. We have a concentration of population all around the globe in a coastal narrow strip. Um, and it becomes really fascinating then when you start to look at that in terms of the human use piece. And the Atlas does that. It tracks really, um, I suppose, the formation of Ireland's coastal zone, those key forces that have sculpted it and shaped it in terms of what arises today, the beautiful beaches and the cliffs and the estuaries that we can enjoy. Um, but then it talks about, you know, the introduction of humans, the earliest settlers over 10,000 years ago. And then you fast forward to today and you look at the contemporary use and you look at the future and you look at the challenges. And the Coastal Atlas just tracks that um, change and value of the coast uh, past, present and future. Valerie, I'm a huge fan of atlases. They, they're stacked all over my apartment, all kinds of different atlases. So uh, I do have, my wife doesn't listen to every episode, but I got to kind of sneak this one past her. So help her out with her Christmas <laughs> shopping. I, I would I would love, that's the kind of thing I just pour over, uh, pick up at odd times, just kind of, you know, lose myself in that kind of, uh, in that kind of thing. I have a couple of interesting atlases of Ireland as well. Uh, I want to, find a little bit more about your your background your origins but uh, i just want to pick up on one thing you mentioned there about the turning your back to the sea and you mentioned the danes so you know the the, the sense in america you know, kind of the mythology in america uh, about ireland's sort of relationship with the sea was that the sea brought trouble the danes mm-hmm. The Vikings, you Indeed. know were coming in and invading and I'm, I'm sure it's a much more complex reason why ireland did not fully embrace its maritime potential. Yeah, I think you have to look back to understand where you are at present and certainly sort of looking deep into history and that, you know, you know, that this was maybe it's a sort of a deeply embedded emotional or mental scar in terms of, you know, what happened when invaders morated um, <laughs> across the land and of course gained access through those key entry points in terms of ports and harbors around the coast. And then you know, you, you fast forward a, a few centuries and, um, you know, Ireland's relationship with seafood is very interesting to look at because, um, you know, we, we had um, this kind of notion of fish on a Friday, fish is about penance um, and therefore it wasn't a highly regarded food source. And, you know, whether right. that's true or not, all of these things become sort of culturally part of what we mm-hmm. are now. And um, certainly, you know, I, I, I spent, you know, talking about my own career, there was one fantastic year I spent where I did a project for the Marine Institute way back in the day, which was about understanding the distribution and abundance of the um, edible periwinkle. Mm-hmm. In Bitterea. So this is a, a, a sea snail uh, that's found on um, intertidal um, shores. And at the time, we wanted to understand, you know, was it being over harvested? Certainly wasn't been picked by periwinkle pickers for the Irish market. Right. People here do not eat sea snails, yep. um, except in one or two uh, small yep. sort of coastal pockets. Um, it's for the French market and you go to France, mm. go to Brittany and a seafood platter is the most extraordinary thing. Uh, mm. Whereas in Ireland, with all of these marine resources and with access to the same um, opportunities, you don't have that same kind of cultural association with seafood. It's changing, um, but it's just very, very interesting. I was reading that there was a... Uh in the Shannon River, uh, a big fishery for, uh, I'll say it wrong here, eels, but I think they're elvers, the, the mm-hmm. juvenile eels, and that's all going probably to Asia. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then actually just to, to pick up on that thread, sort of new fisheries that can be developed. Um, so jellyfish, you know, where there's quite an abundance of jellyfish now, possibly as a result of climate change and changing mm-hmm. 
ocean chemistry and, and changing temperatures and so on. And again, you know, um, having been in Taiwan and places where jellyfish is part of, you know, what you're presented with on the menu, these are opportunities actually, and these opportunities for the future in terms of new species and, and new markets. Um, but interesting, you know, to see if the, the indigenous market um, will actually um, follow those trends. It's a global world and yeah, we'll wait and see. Certainly McDonald's managed to get a foothold, didn't it? <laughs> I know in uh, in Maine they've developed a big sea urchin fishery for for, uh-huh. for, for Asia. Uh, well, d- just talking to you, I can kind of hear the seagulls in the background and the surf and the sand and smell the salt air. How did the how did the salt water get into your veins? Uh, what 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 drove you towards uh, this interest in the coast and the sea and the potential in the ocean? I suppose it just goes back to my upbringing, really. And my parents would have, every summer, we would have gone on holidays down to Ballycotton Bay and stayed in a, a caravan by the sea for the whole of the summer. And yeah, it's just, you know, just having the love of being on the beach and picking periwinkles off the rocks and all of those things. Um, but really, I think the change and the transition came in terms of sort of the sea being a, a choice with regards to career direction. Um, I had the most fantastic time um, on the Irish um, National um, Sea Sail Training Vessel uh, mm. called Ascar 2. Uh, and actually there's a there's a piece in the Atlas on um, the original Ascar and the, the gun running in Hoth and Erskine Childers and all of that, which is incredible drama. But Ascar 2 was this beautiful sailing ship um, that basically was owned by the government and it was all about sail training for young people. Um, and I don't know how I ever even heard of it because I didn't come from a sailing family per se. But when I was 16 and eligible to go off on a trip, I applied, saved my money. And uh, first time I ever flew over to Glasgow, bus to Aberdeen and sailed down uh, through the North Sea over to Delsal in Holland on this incredible um, mm. wooden sailing ship with uh, a crew of 20 young trainees, all between 16 and 25 and a permanent crew of five. Sadly, Asgard too is at the bottom of the Bay of Biscay now. Really, really tragic because what I experienced then changed my life. I remember being on the deck. I did many trips following that and being on the deck and looking out to sea and just thinking I want to do something that's going to really mean I'll have an impact on the marine environment and connect me to the marine environment. Um, So look, I looked around uh, when I did my leaving cert and I knew I didn't want to be a marine biologist. Um, we talked about fish earlier on and I did my bit with the edible periwinkle, but the course that attracted me um, was actually marine geography at the University of Wales in Cardiff. Um, that course is still going to this day and I was lucky enough to be the external examiner for the students now over the last few years. And it just really appealed because it had the biology, it had the oceanography, the human dimension, the economic dimension um, and just a fantastic course. And that was really the the Asgard as the tipping point in terms of falling in love and then the course being the catalyst in terms of a career pathway. What are some of your other academic highlights? We, you know, I see there was a Harvard Business School stint, the uh, Eisenhower Fellow. Did that uh, bring you new perspectives being, you know, living elsewhere or? Oh, yeah. I mean, that was just fantastic. I was so lucky um, back in 2012 um, to be uh, an Eisenhower Fellow. And that um, gave me three months in the States and um, a program that was designed to meet my interests in terms of meeting leaders and influencers in the area of marine conservation, coastal zone management and marine renewables. Um, And I traveled all around from Washington um, down to Austin, Texas, over Mm. to Oregon. Um, Just incredible. Um, And I met academics, I met leaders, I met political representatives, I met NGOs. Um, And of course, you know, we should probably all be blessed enough to be able to do something like that at some point in our lives and careers because it's time out from the day job. It gives you different perspectives. You can learn from what's happening elsewhere and and bring that back. And um, for me, I bought that experience back to a role I had in the university at the time where I was director of the Irish Maritime and Energy Resource Cluster. And that was really focused on developing a, an innovation hub in Cork Harbour. And of course, Cork Harbour, which features very much in the Atlas, is, is I would claim, and, and others too. And this is the Corkonian bias in me, but the maritime capital of Ireland. Um, you know, incredible as a location with the naval base here, naval headquarters. It was a hub in terms of a globally significant provisioning centre for uh, the British Admiralty. 
back in the 1800s and fast forward to today, um, you know, we've got some fantastic research uh, coming out of centres like Marai and the university here. Um, you know, it's a hub for cruise tourism. It's all going on. So the the role I had at the time um, was to really try and look for those opportunities to commercialise research and attract in foreign direct investment companies, including companies from the States, which we did at the time, um, Marine Associates, Naval Architects, Sound and Sea Technology from Washington. Um, it was tremendous. And um, yeah, that opportunity with Eisenhower, it's an incredible program. And it was just brilliant to be selected to participate. And then the, the Harvard piece, oh my God, icing on the cake, you know, <laughs> um, just what an amazing institution. And to go and do a leadership course there, it was all women. Uh, so it was about 60 women from all around the world um, on that executive training piece. And that was just powerful. And it came at a point in my career, which is a bit of a low point for me. And, you know, every now and again, you need something to help you pick back up. Um, and that was just so, so incredible. Um, so yeah, really, really fortunate to have spent that time in the States and over and back. I have a sister in, um, Montauk, uh, had, she moved back to Ireland a couple of years ago, but she was out in Montauk. So, and like every Irish family, lots of, um, relations in, in New York and Long Island and elsewhere. So deep connections and roots. Um, so, you know, just fantastic to have the opportunity through those initiatives to, go beyond the family connection and have those professional connections as well. So as a Dubliner, I'm actually going to pick up on uh, that uh, claim that you're laying for Cork as go being... For it. The, you know uh, you're not going to win. <laughs> as, as being the maritime centre of Ireland, but uh, I honestly understand that I don't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> even, uh, even I know that, Martin. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, well, you, you are biased, Mr. Lee, given your last name, being Absolutely. a type of flows through Cork and your Cork origins. But actually, in truth, I do have Cork origins as well. I have a a Cronin in my background. My great-great-grandfather, John Nutty, was married in Shandon, in Cork, Ah. uh, to a Cronin. So uh, I I do have some kind of connection with your lovely city. Um, Just picking up on what you were talking about in terms of um, extended family that live offshore, etc., and your experiences in the States, Um, I often say to people, it's incredibly important to go outside of Ireland, maybe lean on those networks so that you have a better vision of what's going on inside Ireland. It gives you perspective. I think of that in terms of the literary world and some of the literary giants uh, that have dominated, you know, 20th century literature. James Joyce comes to mind, who basically spent most of his adult life outside of Ireland, or you could talk about George Bernard Shaw, uh, similar, uh, you know, life in terms of living away from the country. So did that um, stint away from Ireland, and and obviously you went to school in Wales for your undergraduate degree. Mm. To what degree did that change your view of Ireland and in your particular area of interest and study? I think that... It's a really important point. Um, first of all, I think Irish people do that quite well um, and through necessity, as opposed to choice for, for many generations in terms of the level of immigration that we have from our country. Um, what is fantastic now is that there's an opportunity for people to go away and to come back. And so what I see, for example, in our own sector in, in offshore wind, um, you know, a lot of expats around the world um, have made, you know, very significant careers for themselves, for example, in oil and gas offshore and now wanting to come back but to come back into this renewable sector and to bring all of that experience with them so that 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 um that's quite a natural thing in terms of how things ebb and flow and, and people come and go um and the connection with ireland as a whole from my own perspective you know international experiences definitely shape how you you think about our marine area and our coastal zone i give one example there's a a small um piece at the end of the atlas where I um, present, of all things, um, a case study of a small island nation in Micronesia called Palau. Um, mm-hmm. And a few years ago, I worked with the um, Ocean Centre in Stanford University and with a whole number of other academics um, in collaboration with the Palauan government to review their plan to designate their entire exclusive economic zone offshore bar a small uh, piece close to shore as a no-take area and for marine conservation. 
and just incredible for a tiny island nation like that. So dependent on, you know, international relationships with Japan and the US and others that would have benefited from their fishery resources, for example, to be brave enough to say we're going to stand up and say we want to protect our oceans. Um, so through that work, you know, the, the working group was looking at a whole range of factors, you know, the in- influence of, of climate change in terms of the changing nature of fisheries into the future, looking at local markets in terms of how seafood uh, consumption like here could be increased locally, um, as well as, you know, maximizing the opportunity with the export market um, and so much more. And so the one thing that struck me is that in UN parlance, Palau is a CID, a small island developing nation. And, and that's that classification of, of um, island nation that we're kind of familiar with in that world. But the Palauans refer to themselves not as a small island developing nation, but as a large ocean state. Mm. And for me, when I look at Ireland, we're a small island nation that hasn't quite managed um, culturally to redefine ourselves as a large ocean state. And, and going back to the start of our conversation, I think we're at that pivot point in terms of our relationship with the sea. Um, that will have us looking more outward, um, certainly over the next 10 years and beyond. And particularly, um, you know, that the energy transition is going to be driving that because our offshore wind opportunity and our floating wind opportunity in particular is, is just so enormous. It's interesting how you can kind of, you know, take exposure maybe to another country's problems, maybe a smaller country than, as Palau is. And then understand or how it kind of redraws your understanding of your native country, Ireland in this case, uh, and how it relates to the sea. So, yeah, point well taken. I'm going to switch over to the coastal atlas. I I want to give that, you know, a good look just to kind of explain to listeners uh, the scale of this book. It's 893 pages long. It's got 33 chapters, 149 contributors. It weighs, as you mentioned, in almost five kilos or 10 pounds. Um, really amazing project that seven years in the making, as we kind of alluded to earlier, and you are one of the five editors. But let me ask this question. Uh, I've never heard of a coastal atlas before. Uh, have other countries done this? And why does Ireland, why do you think it's so important for Ireland to have that? Hmm. I think this coastal atlas is unique. I think there, there there would be other books that would present as a as a coastal atlas, and they may, in particular, focus on the visual dimension, um, and maybe you know a particular approach to, to to mapping and presentation of maps. Um, but I don't think there's anything quite like this um, in any other jurisdiction that I'm aware of, and and I very interested in the feedback we've been getting from Australia and mm. other places where academics are saying, we need to do this for our country. So the Coastal Atlas of Ireland, as far as we know, Martin, is, is absolutely unique as a publication. There would be other atlases out there, but they might focus more on the, the photographic dimension or maybe more basic mapping. This is hugely comprehensive because the maps, which are really at the essence of the book, um, are complemented and explained at a really high level of detail with a huge amount of academic rigor, but in such a way that it's accessible for everyone. Um, so I think it is unique in that way. Um, why does Ireland need a coastal atlas or why does anywhere need a coastal atlas? Um, I think it's hugely important to draw attention to the coast for a number of reasons. Um, you know, the coast, as we said earlier on, is a hub for population all around the world. So about 50% of the global population lives within 100 kilometres of the coast. So you have that real intensification of settlement and equally productivity. 40% of global GDP comes from the coastal zone, from the coastal economy. Um, And then, you know, the coast is an area where you have such huge diversity of habitats and richness in terms of species. Um, It's an area that really, you know, provides a huge amount of resources, but equally is in peril and is hugely vulnerable and therefore it needs to be protected. Um, So to do a coastal atlas is to draw attention to why the coast is special and unique. It's to draw attention to the fact that this is a precious part of the planetary, um, I suppose, system. But equally from my vantage point, because we're living now in the Anthropocene, where the coast 
Coastal Atlas speaks to this, you know, where the, the forces of humankind are greater than any geological force or any other force on the planet. So, you know, the damage that we're doing as a species, as we know, in terms of the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis is extraordinary. But the coast for me is the place that if we can concentrate attention here, it's almost like a living laboratory. And if we can crack it in terms of sustainable development at the coastal zone, um, then we will be able to deal with those fundamental existential threats that the Anthropocene presents. So the coastal zone makes sense to try and understand better as an ecosystem and to try and understand better the human nature dynamic that it presents. Well, Val, that sounds like a great way to get into the other side of your your. It sounds like you have more than two sides of what you're up to, but getting away from the more kind of maybe a- academic and editorial pursuit, uh, that idea of developing something uh, that that contributes to sustainability through the coastal region uh, gets us into the wind power generation. Mm-hmm. Why don't you just give us a little background on this form of wind power, how it's different and what its potential, particularly for Ireland, might be? Absolutely. Well, look, um, floating offshore wind is a really fascinating technology. Um, it's at uh, an early commercial level in terms of rollout. Um, countries that are leading in this include Scotland, um, also um, Portugal, um, off the coast of Pembroke and Wales, where Simply Blue Group are developing 96 uh, megawatts of a floating wind project. Um, but quickly, um, we're going to see the very intensive ramp up of floating wind projects, particularly in the decade ahead. For example, in Europe, um, the Commission expects to see 10 gigawatts of floating wind by the end of the decade. Now, why it's different to what has gone on before in terms of turbines in the ocean um, is that the, the traditional approach to offshore wind is with what's called fixed bottom technology. And what that means is that the the turbines are um, secured in such a way that um, it's piled, the foundations are piled into the seafloor. In order to do that, you typically operate in relatively benign and shallow waters up to about 30 metres deep. Um, So if you fly over the North Sea or the Baltic Sea and even parts of the Irish Sea, you'll you'll see an abundance of bottom fixed uh, floating wind farms Um, generating a huge amount of clean and renewable energy from our marine resource. And that's absolutely tremendous. But actually over 80% 80 of our global uh, wind resource is in waters deeper than 60 metres. So what floating wind technology does is it allows us to access that resource. That resource is a place where there's better what's called capacity factor. So, for example, the wind blows stronger out there, as you can imagine, without any kind of interruption because it's not closer to the land where you get that sort of greater opportunity for turbulence and so on. Um, And so it's floating technology because it is not piled into the seafloor, but is secured through a system of moorings and anchors. But it's not altogether new technology, John. So what it's doing, it's bringing expertise on floating production platforms, uh, which would be omnipresent, for example, in offshore oil and gas. Um, And it's combining that knowledge with what we know about wind turbine technology and putting that together, uh, but making that happen in such a way that we're unlocking the potential of deeper waters. And that has advantages because it's further from shore, it's less visual impact. um, And of course, also from sort of an installation point of view, it's slightly less intrusive than the fixed bottom technology as well. So it sounds like you had to... Uh, ramp up your your knowledge base from the ma- marine geography here to understand at least a lot about engineering, uh, construction, atmospheric science, uh, lo- a lot at play here. Oh, listen, John, I've gone into a whole new world. <laughs> so I was 21 years in UCC and um, I actually left academia last August, 12 months and uh, joined Simply Blue Group then. And that was just, you know, a whole new world for me in terms of going into the commercial world, number one. Um, But learning how to to lead and and manage, you know, very large multidisciplinary teams. Um, The first thing we did um, during the introduction, Martin mentioned the Emerald uh, Floating Wind Project. I'm the project managing director for a company now that is a a joint venture partnership between Simply Blue, uh, which is an Irish company, an Irish developer, a blue economy developer and um, Shell. So it's a joint venture partnership that we're we're managing. Um, Shell bring all of that offshore oil and gas expertise 
to the party, which is so, so important. All of that engineering expertise that you mentioned, John, uh, plus they've been involved in offshore wind in the UK and other markets for the last 20 years. And they have really been establishing themselves as leaders in, in floating wind with, um, you know, the um, acquisition of Eolfi in France and um, support for technology like principal powers, uh, floating foundations, etc. So they're an extraordinary partner for us. Um, and I'm privileged to be working with a, a team now that includes experts in project management, environmental science, engineering and so on from both Simply Blue and Shell. And the Simply Blue piece also really, I suppose, so important that we have and, and you know, that that, that, that piece um, that, for example, Captain Brian Fitzgerald, who used to be second in command in the Irish Naval Service, joined our team um, earlier this year to head up the whole stakeholder engagement and external relations piece. Um, social license to operate is key. You know, there's a lot of requirements in terms to make this a reality for Ireland. Um, you know, we need to shift the dial in terms of policy. We need to shift the dial in terms of official dumps, awareness and appreciation for quite what's at stake. Um, you know, we need to build industrial supply chains. But most importantly is we need to bring everybody with us. And so when we talk about key stakeholders to influence, it's civil society first, industry and government. Um, and that's part of the, the magic that Simply Blue brings to the equation because I think we focus so much on, you know, values in action and, and that part of um, change management because development is all about change. Just to um, maybe just to expand things a little bit for listeners, uh, as I understand it, the, this project envisages the generation of 1.3 gigawatts of power. And of course, uh, when you get into these kind of arcane terms, it's kind of difficult to explain that at times. But as I understand it, we're talking about basically enough power for something like 400,000 homes in Ireland, which uh, are, are maybe more, which is a significant amount given that Ireland only has a 2 million homes. So we're actually talking about over 20% of the housing in Ireland. So this is an extraordinarily large project. And to some degree, I guess that's why you bring, you know, brought Shell in there because you have, they understand how to operate at scale. But I'm guessing also on a level that some of your environmental friends may be looking askance at the participation of Shell in this project and maybe accusing you uh, you know, or simply bloom of uh, assisting a big oil company in doing some kind of greenwashing. Is that something that people raise? And if so, do you have to speak to that? And how do you answer that? Do you know, surprisingly, Martin, um, it's not something that we have found as any kind of constraint. Um, I think what we see more than anything else is that people understand that this needs to happen. You know, when you're talking about the development of floating offshore wind off the south coast of Ireland, you know, it goes back to everything we've just said. You know, we have this incredible resource, but also we have national targets to meet and a moral responsibility to meet them in terms of decarbonisation of the economy. We also have a situation where the energy security picture in Ireland is extremely vulnerable um, and we need to develop our own indigenous sources of energy. Um, coupled with the fact that floating offshore wind has got all of these sort of environmental benefits that I spoke about a while ago. You know, I think what's absolutely key to understand here is the Emerald project in terms of CapEx, which is the capital cost. You know, you're talking about upwards of two billion of capital being required to build that offshore wind farm off the old head of Kinsale. It'll be a minimum of about 35 kilometres distance from the shore. Um, you know, the government cannot do that. The taxpayer cannot do that. So we need those strategic partners also from the point of view of the bank balance. Um, and I think that, you know, more than anything else, those that have, you know, that, that may feel somewhat threatened by this new dimension of utilisation of marine space, such as the, the fishing community, um, you know, who one would anticipate might be most vocal about this. And certainly, you know, they're, they're concerned about sea space being taken up for different uses. Um, but again and again, you know, and with our stakeholder engagement and so on, going from peer to peer, people aren't getting hung up on this is shell or this is greenwashing. There's an acceptance that this has to happen and this is coming. Now, the question is then, how do we do that in the way that there is a win-win? 
for all. And in particular, what's the win for coastal communities? Because the deep population from coastal communities um, is quite staggering. And this is a way of breathing life back into the periphery of Ireland. Our project is on the south coast, um, but the government announced in the programme for government last year um, an ambition for 30 gigawatts of floating offshore wind in the Atlantic. Now, Martin, you referenced the 1.3 gigawatts in the, the Emerald Project and what that means. It's actually upwards close to about a million homes. Um, so a few floating wind farms and energy security tick, electrification, decarbonisation objectives tick. So what it means is that the scale of the opportunity and the scale of the resource is such that not only can we meet our indigenous needs, but this is an opportunity to export and to export energy to Europe. And so it's opening up all kinds of really exciting opportunities in terms of shifting either um, electrons or molecules, molecules, by the way, of green hydrogen, for example, into the heartland of Europe and across the way to the UK where there's energy scarcity issues. So this is this is the North Sea oil that the Norwegians found decades ago. You know, this is this is offshore wind and floating wind is to Ireland what oil is to Saudi Arabia. That sounds quite extreme, but that's the significance of the opportunity here. And I suppose you, you mentioned at the opening, the week that's in it, it's all about COP um, and, you know, the, the focus on the urgency to meet our targets. What I'm most disappointed about is that the government in the run up to COP published our National Climate Action Plan um, and failed to put in a target for floating offshore wind in that plan. So that ambition stated in that political document, the programme for government of 30 gigawatts for the West Coast, didn't transcend into a coherent, tangible policy action that we can you know, hold government to account on. So we've, we've a bit to go in terms of, um, you know, making sure that there is better awareness um, across those key leaders and influencers of, of quite what's at stake here. Um, just two weeks ago, um, Equinor, who came into Ireland to develop offshore wind projects, including floating projects with the ESB, unfortunately made a decision to leave the Irish market. So we've been hugely successful in Ireland, um, almost through accident by design, at um, presenting the Irish offshore wind market as something that's really, really attractive. And a huge amount of foreign direct investment has come in, not just Shell, but Ibridola, previously Equinor, and a whole range of very, very significant players. Um, and so, you know, we need the government to act to pave the way so that this can become a reality, not post-2030, but we need to see projects in the water this decade so that we're developing the supply chain. I think the the, the most um, significant obstacle that we have right now is a misperception that floating wind is still an early stage technology. And every other country in Europe is declaring targets for 2030. Spain, France, Norway, Sweden. Yesterday morning, the Crown Estate in the UK published a proposal to support four gigawatts of floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea um, by 2030. And yet we have the most phenomenal resource, the most significant offshore wind resource, almost globally. We have indicated an intention to develop this sector and, and yet we fail to put the right policy measures in place to hold the country to account for progress in that regard. And that has consequences right across the board, not just in terms of climate targets, but in terms of those coastal communities where the fishing industry is under huge pressure in terms of sustainability and viability to unlock new opportunities and a new lifeline and new livelihoods. That's what this opportunity presents. Um, so look, I, I'm loving the change in direction for myself personally from academia to this whole area because this is about impact and absolutely these projects will happen but we need to make sure that they're happening sooner rather than later and that Ireland isn't going to lose out. You know, the, the comment about Shell, I, I came across a, a phrase recently, global energy transition as a kind of, maybe it's something you've heard before, I, it was new to me, but I would think Shell would want to be involved with something like that. You know, that that's they see the future. Absolutely. Um, well, you, there's other ways to get energy from the sea. Uh, there's the various kinds of tidal and wave uh, uh, energy generation. Is there, is there competition in that area for resources? Uh, 
which is the best? <laughs> That's a brilliant question. Um, so when you look at the sort of the, the spectrum of marine renewable energy, um, there are different forms. So we've been talking about offshore wind. We've been talking about a, a subset of that, which is floating offshore wind. Um, when we look at wave and, and tidal technology, um, they are still pre-commercial. So there, there's still no one um, wave technology, for example, to emerge that is de facto um, you know, proven as a as a commercially viable technology. That's it. I, I mentioned that Simply Blue Group, we're blue economy developers. So we have a, a whole number of um, floating wind projects. Um, we have Salamander in Scotland. We have a Blue Gem Wind Project with Total in Wales. Um, there's Emerald with Shell off the south coast. We have a project off the west coast of Ireland, off Clare, which is called Western Star. And just a few weeks ago, we announced um, our entry into the US market with Total Energies um, to develop floating wind on both coasts uh, mm. in the US. So um, Simply Blue um, is a leading developer of floating wind projects globally. Um, but we're also interested in wave energy and we have um, an interest also in low impact aquaculture. And we're deploying and developing um, projects in Scotland in particular um, that are focused on the latter come back to the wave piece and our interest in wave, uh, we're priming a site off the Clare coast um, as developers um, to deploy wave energy technology off the west coast of Ireland um, in the decade ahead. And we're watching um, uh, technology such as core power out of Sweden very, very closely. They'll be going into the water off Portugal in the new year with a full scale device to test um, and subject to the outcomes of, of those successful tests and demonstrations. Um, we'll certainly be I think pioneering and brave and backing um, technology in such a way that we're creating um, the environment where it can plug and play when it's ready. So we see wave um, energy as um, you know a- another frontier, um, mm-hmm. and certainly one to watch. Uh, and to the point that we're we're investing in it hugely at risk at the moment. Uh, so we can really be prepared to help the rollout of that technology when the time comes. And that's relevant and it does it doesn't automatically compete for example with floating wind which can depending on which wave technology you you choose might be nearer to or further from shore and wave energy you know in terms of talking about the palaus and the small island states you know whether it's in the caribbean or whether it's anywhere else there's a lot of small island states that um would uniquely benefit from wave energy um so it's, it's a huge global market there to watch and Ireland certainly has invested very significantly in R&D around the whole marine renewables piece, University College Cork and um, other academic centres around the country here. There's, there's a lot of critical mass. And I think it's it's perhaps been disappointing that that commercialisation piece hap- hasn't happened sooner. Um, but there's a big push on. There's a lot of targets been set by the European Commission to drive this. And there's a lot of investment going into making it a reality. I think there's a head of steam being built up here. I'm, you know, like I, I'm one of the podcasts that I really enjoy listening to is uh, David McWilliams, you know, the Irish economist. And, you know, he frequently uses a term that's kind of used a lot in association with Ireland and, you know, marine generation possibilities. He said, you know, Ireland should be the Saudi Arabia of wind. Uh, I guess not just wind, but also all sorts of other kind of marine generation possibilities. And I think you've made the case very clearly that there's a huge untapped resource. But let's let me understand where Emerald is right now. Are we talking about we need to kind of uh, get this two billion of capital up and running, uh, or uh, you know, is it simply the nuts and bolts of okay, let's start building out these platforms? What's the timeline look like? Where does the project stand? What are the critical concerns? What do we look forward to? That's a great question. So we're at a very early stage of development, Mm -hmm. um, which means that we're at a process where we've identified the site, we've done initial feasibility studies, um, and we'll be gearing up to go forward to achieve what's called site control, which is our marine lease, uh, which will be a big milestone for us. And I'll come back to that in a minute in terms of um, what needs to change such that that is um, a reality sooner rather than later. Um, but really, look, it's a 10-year pathway uh, to cut the chase. Um, these are huge projects. Um, so the next big thing is going through the whole consenting process. Uh, and to do that, we have to prepare for our environmental impact assessment. 
Uh, we've got planes up at the moment and have had for, for quite a while and, and we'll continue to do for the next year and a half, uh, doing aerial surveys of bird and mammal populations in and around the site. Um, we have um, experts on the coast um, in and around the harbour at the moment uh, doing field work in relation to birds. Um, we have our engineers looking at the, the ground conditions with regards to data that's available so that we can start to understand um, suitability for uh, mooring and anchoring systems and then making choices in relation to which foundation technology is best and doing those, um, I suppose, deals ultimately with the wind turbine suppliers. So there's there's elements of a project that um, relate to the environmental consenting, the engineering design, health and safety, absolutely key. Uh, we have a whole work package on social license to operate um, and then we have our commercial work package, which is looking at those routes to market um, through grid or, you know, looking at those other really fascinating um, opportunities. For example, like I mentioned earlier on with regards to green hydrogen production. And then there's a project management work package. So there's a team at the moment of 16 um, working across all of those different functions, driving on all of this. That team will um, be enhanced significantly when we get our lease. And so everything that's happening at the moment is that it's very early stage development. It's hugely risky because there is no single developer in Ireland um, that has got um, a lease for an area of the seabed, particularly issues arising outside of 12 nautical miles because the government is in the process of overhauling um, the whole system of maritime regulation. Uh, with regards to activities in the sea area that pertain to the need to have either a lease or a license to undertake particular activities. So we've been working with antiquated foreshore legislation that dates back to, I think, about 1933. There's a whole chapter in the Atlas on it and huge detail on that. If anybody's interested, <laughs> um, Anne Rio Hagan, a fantastic um, colleague and, and expert on all of the above, was one of the key authors on that. Um, but it goes back to the point that we had our back turned to the sea. And so for many, many years, there's been deep frustration, for example, from the aquaculture sector and other sectors that were trying to get up and running with the system of regulation. Um, fast forward to 2019 and the government produced the first climate action plan and the first target ever for offshore wind, three and a half gigawatts at the time, it's been increased subsequently. And what I have seen and experienced over the last two years um, not just on the industry side where there's huge interest in Ireland as a market for this, um, but on the governance side where government officials have literally been um, revolutionising, for want of a better word, the marine policy and planning enabling framework for this country. We need to get it right now so there's strong foundations for the future. The frustrating bit is it's happening now and it's in the way of impact and implementation, and it jeopardizes our opportunity to reach those targets that we need to be aiming for for 2030. So I would urge and urge again and again, it's almost like a daily prayer, mm -hmm. that government put more resources into key departments and agencies um, such that this can be accelerated. Because right now there's a huge risk um, that the key milestone in terms of being able to achieve what's called your marine area consent, in other words, your lease for these projects to really invest and drive on, and uh, that, that that milestone won't be reached. And what will happen is if everybody gets their consent at the same time, there'll be a huge bottleneck in the supply chain. Everybody will want to be getting to that tipping point where you're investing millions to get geophysical and geotechnical surveys done. And there's only so many boats to go around. So this is the reality of the challenge ahead. Um, so the opportunity is phenomenal, as I outlined, but it's not without challenges. And, you know, we need to have the political narrative and the fantastic leadership been shown right across government, all departments, all parties. But particularly Eamon Ryan, I think, has been transformative in, you know, really saying floating wind and Ireland. But that political narrative needs to cascade and manifest in tangible policy targets and equally proper resources for decision making such that leases and licenses can be awarded. I think the uh, the coastal atlas will fit into that very well in terms of uh, resetting the, the conversation very dramatically. It's, it's amazing to hear these uh, initiatives. And when I think of climate change, I always think of Ireland and the crosshairs. Yeah. It seems like so many aspects of climate change could 
could and will collide on Ireland unless things like what you're initiating here uh, are, are accomplished. Uh, we come to the th- part of the program where we bring in our friend Seamus Plug, and we asked our guests to uh, let us know, what, you know what you'd like our audience to, to know about for you, what's your action items for the Irish Stew audience. I think that, you know, this is a fantastic opportunity and platform just to talk about floating offshore wind. And as I said earlier on, you know, it's all about the social license to operate and bringing communities with us. So, you know, I think for people to be informed and to be aware, as I said, we've gone into the States, there's other jurisdictions all around the world um, where this is going to need to be made to happen. So that would be the first the first thing is just, you know, Floating offshore wind, we've talked about it today. That awareness is, is really important. Um, but secondly, of course, if you want to know anything about floating offshore wind or wave energy or tidal energy, it's all there in the marine renewables chapter in the coastal atlas. If you want to know about the regulatory piece that we just talked about, it's there. If you want to know about Palau, um, if you want to know about the earliest settlers, the role of the Ice Age, the Vikings, the Normans, um, right up to the future coast piece and what those implications will be in terms of Ireland and the crosshairs for climate. Um, it's all in the Atlas. So the shameless, shameless plug piece is um, the Atlas is available in all good bookshops here, but equally it's <laughs> available online. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, etc., etc. But I would love if anybody was interested in it. Um, it's 49 euros. Um, it's available through the, the Cork University Press website. Uh, and I would encourage great. people to and drive people to, to that location to support the, the Cork University Press, who have been just a pleasure and a joy to work with throughout this whole project. It's a brilliant uh, publishing house that punches way above its weight. Fantastic. Well, you check the show notes on this episode for, for that information. And, and Val, thanks so much from my, my side. And look forward to seeing what you're going to do in the United States. Obviously, a, a major a major market for what you're doing. And Val, uh, thank you from my end. Um, it was great to get some detailed insight into the world in which you operate. The opportunity is exciting. Fingers crossed that things go well in you know in the upcoming months and years. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Ireland as a dominant energy giant. So thank you for your time. Likewise, thank you. Hey, John, I really enjoyed that conversation with Val. She delivered a lot of information that clarified a great deal in terms of my understanding, especially on floating wind and especially on the importance of the whole coastal environment. But there's a phrase that actually comes to mind following that discussion, and that's Martin Luther King, uh, who had this wonderful quote talking about the importance of the fierce urgency of now. In other words, let's get things done right away. And that seems to be even more pertinent in light of COP26 in Glasgow. I don't think there's anybody on the planet at this point in time that doesn't appreciate not only do we have to act, but we have to act quickly. Otherwise, we're going to be faced with increasing climate devastation. And so what Val's proposing is solving really two problems, the energy problem in Ireland, because Ireland isn't a particularly energy-rich country, and also addressing decarbonization, which is fundamental to solving our climate crisis. Well, Martin, I wish I was as optimistic as you that people really do get what's going on here. But maybe this kind of conversation helps spread the word about the urgency that you spoke of. Yeah, I like the Val taking us back to that vision of traditionally Ireland turning its back to the sea, sees where danger came from. Maybe opportunity is going to come from the sea in her future. She's turning Ireland's gaze back to the coast, the shores, out to the waves and especially out to the winds of the open sea. She's done it in two ways, through her coastal atlas of Ireland, all 10 pounds of it, which she helped edit. And she's glancing over the horizon with her emerald project, Floating Wind Farms, she's working to create. The potential of a great coastal resource that will help Ireland become much better positioned to exploit a source of cleaner, greener energy. Irish Stew is produced by John Lee, Martin Nutty, 
and Bill Schultz. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Bill Schultz. Music on Irish Stew was composed and performed by Rosa Nutty, with Donald Bowens on drums, Cahill O'Reardon on bass and synthesizer. For more on Rosa Nutty's music, please visit rosanutty.com. (laughs) 